on behalf of the Friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries who are sponsoring today's program. If you'd like more information about becoming a friend of the library, visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends. Be sure to join us next Wednesday at 12.10 p.m. for Tulsa and Mobile, Past and Present, presented by Phil Armstrong, a member of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. If you don't have a link for next week, email friends at tulsalibrary.org to request a link. Our program today is being recorded and will be available later on the Tulsa Library YouTube page. At the end of our program, there will be opportunity for questions and answers. Please type any questions you would like Marlon to answer in the chat box. Our traveler today is Reverend Marlon Lavenhar. Marlon grew up in Highland Park, Illinois. He received a BA in psychology, in sociology, sorry, from Tulane University in 1990. Upon graduation, he relocated to Kyoto, Japan, where he worked and studied for two years. Leaving Japan, he and a friend took a three year, 20,000 mile around the world odyssey on mountain bikes. Upon returning to the United States, he entered Harvard Divinity School where he received his master's in divinity in 1999. He was ordained as a Unitarian Universalist minister in 1999 and went on to serve the historic First Church in Boston. In 2000, Marlin was called to All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa as a senior minister. All Souls is the largest Unitarian Universalist church in the United States with almost 2,000 members. That was a surprise to me. In 2010, he received the Humanitarian of the Year Award from the Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office for his work to end the persecution of gay and lesbian people in Uganda, Africa. Marlon is married to Anitra Lavenhar, and they have two children. Please welcome Reverend Marlon Lavenhar. Thank you, Marion, and thanks everyone for joining me today. I'm going to share my screen here and get this slideshow going. I've got to have pictures. It's a three-year journey, so I'm not going to be able to do three years and 40 minutes, but I will be able to show some highlights and and share with you the cast, some of the cast of characters that I bumped into as I cycled around the world, a couple of years in Asia and a year across Europe and the Middle East. Um, so we're going to start with this first this first map, which uh, I put together after I got back. Uh, this was this journey was from 1990. It was 1992, three, four, and five. So a three year period in there covering those years. And when I got back in 1995, we didn't have all this fancy internet stuff. So I just took a, a map of the world and I took some tape and I just taped this together. So this is, I'm still using this same old graphic, but you'll see up here in the, in the right hand side, Japan. And I crossed Japan, took a ferry boat across to China to Shanghai, bicycled across China. And I'll show you some slides of a lot of these different things up to the, to the desert. And then at the, at the, when we got to the Gobi Desert, we actually got turned around. We were headed up this way to the Karakoram Highway. We were gonna head into Pakistan, but the highway got washed out by an avalanche. So we ended up being diverted down through Tibet and over the Himalaya mountains instead. And in as we crossed the, the Himalaya mountains, Tibet had been closed for independent tourists for decades. And they opened it up because of the avalanche, because there were travelers who couldn't get out. And so they showed, so we got to go through here and it was a pretty rare uh, glimpse through Tibet at a time when people didn't see bicyclists and others coming through uh, as independent travelers. And it came back down through India and you'll see, we'll go up through all across India, almost uh, six months in India, three months crossing into Pakistan to the border of Afghanistan and Iran. And I couldn't get further that direction. So turned back around, came back across, and you'll see ended up in Vietnam and up through southern China and eventually into the Philippines. So that was the first two years before I get to Europe and some of the other things. So I'll tell you as we go, and you can ask questions, and Marion's going to help me field the questions. And I'll just, uh, I'll just take you on a little journey with me. I appreciate you. Uh, joining me for this. So China is a lot like a staircase. It starts kind of flat 
over on the east side. And as you go, you go all the way across to the Himalaya Mountains all the way on the west. And so these are just give you a little sense of some of the switchbacks coming through some of the, the hills in the middle of China. Um, and then everywhere we stop, my friend here, this the, the woman in the brown sweater's name is Bobby, and she was my uh, girlfriend at the time. And we were, went to college together at Tulane University and then decided to, we lived in Japan for, uh, for a couple of years, made money to take this trip. Uh, we were teaching English in Japan and uh, from 1990 to 1992. And then we set off on this journey. But in China, whenever we stopped somewhere, for anything, we were just surrounded by crowds of people who had never seen Americans before, never seen bicycles like we had before. And they would even let, we, we would be riding down long stretches and somebody would pass us on a bicycle and they would go and tell the people in the next village that we were coming and they'd let all the schools out. So by the time we got to the village, there would be children and people of all ages lining the streets, just watching us bicycle through and the kids would wave at us and uh, sometimes we'd stop and talk to them and show them our bicycles and things like that if we had time but honestly there were points when we just wanted to stop and have lunch eat an apple or something and and get on our way without having to entertain a whole crowd of people so sometimes we'd find places to hide under bridges or anywhere we could to just have a moment by ourselves but it was pretty pretty exciting for everybody as we came through China it took us about six months to cross China. Now, as we biked along China, we came across, this is a doorway that was just built into the side of the road. The, the, uh -huh. You can see the soil on the side of the road that's just built this doorway. And you can see this is the bed of the person who lives in there. And this is his entire home. So his home consists of this bed here on the right. And uh, then this is a stove. You can see the ashes coming out down at the bottom. And, uh, and he's got, uh, I'm sorry, that's the ashes that warm his bed. Those are, that's how he heats his bed at night. Um, this is the stove over here. And uh, again, it's all just the bed, the stove, everything's just built out of the soil itself. Now there are, uh, at least when I was crossing through, there were uh, over a couple hundred thousand people living in cave homes like this across China. Now here's a more upscale cave home. You can see up in the top left, the grass line. So you can see they've just built down into the soil and then built these homes. And some of the homes are beautiful with windows and nice doors and, and you know, quite, quite beautiful. But, and you go in and the couches, the beds, the, the stove, everything are built out of the soil itself. So again, a couple hundred thousand people in China, I believe still to this day living uh, in homes like this through the, the soil. We got up to the to the desert, as I mentioned, we were headed up north to Pakistan, we were trying to follow was considered the Silk Road, the where silk and other products went back and forth between Europe and China and Asia in the ancient times. But we, we when we got here to the beginning of the Gobi Desert, we ended up being diverted, as I said, because of an avalanche uh, on the Karakoram Highway. So we diverted down to Tibet. Now in Tibet, uh, this is a, one of the highlights of our time in Tibet. We bicycled at one point over dirt roads for about 10 hours and then for about an hour and a half just on the, just on the grass here that you can see uh, to find some villages of Tibetan nomads. So nomadic people living up uh, long, way above the tree line. You can see there are no trees at all because the trees can't exist this high up. This is probably 12,000 feet, 13,000 feet. Um, and uh, these people are herders where they have yak and sheep and they take them and they move with them or as the snow comes, they move further down or wherever they need to go in order to survive. Um, these, this family took us in, this little group of families, uh, nomads, just waved us over and took us in. We didn't speak their language. We had, we'd learned a few words of Chinese um, and a few words of Tibetan. But we comp communicated a lot with sign language and just our basic human humanity. In this picture, the, the man of the household is uh, what he has in his mouth is some rope that he is creating out of the wool from the tail of the yak. So they cut the tail of the yak and then weave that into rope. And they take, he'd take some ash, and use his hands, and he would just continue to um, create this rope, which was uh, very strong, in fact. And 
um, as I keep going here, let's see. This next picture, you can see, uh, I think one of the more interesting parts of this picture is that you have here the meat hanging up uh, over the, there's a flap at the top of their yurt. And the yurt is made out of, uh, again, the wool from, from the sheep and wool from the yaks that are all woven together. And there's a flap on the top and the, the floor is made of um, soil. It's just soil. They put down sheep's pelts on the floor. That's where we slept at night. And they sit on the sheep's pelts all just on the floor. And they have this stove. If you can see at the bottom of the screen, I can't tell whether you can see it on your screen or not, but there is a, a stove built out of the the soil and it's shaped like a triangle and they put dried yak dung in there because they don't have trees to burn and so that but that burns really well and it doesn't smell it's just dried out and so they just they just keep shoving it closer to the the narrow part of the triangle where they keep the pot and where they cook and then that smoke smokes the meat which is hanging there on one of the two uh bars that hold up the yurt they don't have refrigeration or refrigerator so it just gets smoked and they just cut off pieces for for dinner as they did when we were there and uh and they don't have too many things let's see though i think this next picture will show um yeah they have a year they, they they take the yak milk and they create butter so they have this churn for that again this is a better picture of that triangle shaped stove that i told you about is this yak uh, yak dung that's burning here and they put the pot right up here and they cook and that's about all their possessions they have the churn they have some saddles for their yaks they have some rope and uh, a few different things but not a lot some sheep's pelts to sleep on some blankets a little bit of jewelry a uh, couple of uh, bowls and a little bit of uh, silverware to cook with and, uh, and that's about it. Uh, just lovely, beautiful people. We enjoyed this. This is, this is me. And in my hand, I have this pink Frisbee that I traveled all over with. And they, it fell out of my bag. They said, what's this? I tried to explain uh, with sign language. Eventually, I had to take it outside. They were like, is it a plate? You know, they were doing uh, different sign language, trying to figure out what it was. So I took them outside. We threw around the Frisbee for a while. They were pretty good at it. So I think they must, uh, they must play with the yak chips or something uh sometimes when they're kids and then you can see one of the nomads is is taking my bicycle out for a little little trip around he, he was enjoying it it had 20 uh was it 28 gears which was something that they'd never seen before uh, but pretty exciting up here in tibet uh, this is mount everest from the tibet side no most people see the pictures from the nepal side because again it's so hard to get into tibet for so long people didn't travel from there, we we traveled up Tibet uh, to the advanced base camp at 20,000 feet. Now we bicycled to a village, left our bikes in that village, which was at around 14,700 feet. And we hiked up the last, uh, for about 10 days round trip to get up to the advanced base camp. We had some, uh, some Sherpas and Yaks helping us for part of the trip. But when we got to the glacier, uh, on Everest, they turned around and we did the last part on our own and hiked back on our own. But this was gorgeous land and very, very high uh, up there. You could see a, a fairly um, nice village in Tibet. I mean, this is a, this is a more of a high end village with a with a Buddhist stupa here and the wall around. This isn't the Great Wall of China. This is far from the Great Wall of China, but these walls that protected the community for centuries um, are are throughout different parts of China. And uh, inside the temple, you can see these these long horns that they use for their devotion. The monks. These are Tibetan monks chanting. What's interesting is these candles are. They're burning not wax, but yak butter. So they, they create these yak butter lamps and they use the yak butter for, for their skin. They put it on their skin. They use it for lamps. They use it in their tea. Um, and they have yak butter tea and other, uh, you know, it's one of their staple foods, but they use it for everything, for cooking, for lotion, for light, for, for 
all kinds of different things. Um, here are a couple of Tibetan nomads who, who come in. See, they often come in to one of the temples maybe once a year, maybe twice a year for some kind of a pilgrimage. And they'll also come and they'll bring some of their sheep or yaks and they'll sell them. And that's where they get their clothes and their blankets or their barter to get their stuff. So, so they'll take a couple trips into a bigger city and uh, but while they're there, they'll often circumnavigate the the temple, sometimes prostrate on their knees and hands and do devotion and things like that. Um, so now, oh, let me so I'm going to I'm going to jump quickly because, again, I only have 40 minutes. I'm going to jump quickly to Nepal. But to get to Nepal from Tibet, we were up at uh, our last journey was 100 miles all downhill from about 14,000 feet, the highest, the, the last pass, all the way down to Friendship Bridge across to Nepal. But when we started, we were wearing wool gloves and hats and sweaters and everything you can imagine. And then by the time the day ended, and of course there were no trees, there were no fruits, no vegetables. We were way up in the Himalayas, 100 miles downhill later, which was a lot of braking and really hard on the shoulders on these switchback dirt roads. But when we got down there, we were in Nepal and the people were, you know, had baskets on their heads filled with mangoes and bananas and oranges and all kinds of coconuts. And they were wearing just like a loincloth, but otherwise, you know, no, no coverings and it was hot. So we were just shedding all of our wool stuff. And by the time the day ended, we were in a tropical uh, uh, area of Nepal. Now in this picture, not the best photograph, but what it shows, I think is interesting. This here is a goat being sacrificed. And this is in an outdoor temple, a Hindu temple. And right here, you see these little vestibules and in them is the goddess, statues of the goddess Kali. And the goddess Kali, the goddess of destruction is, is being worshiped. And the way they do that is they'll take a goat or they'll take pigeons or chickens, and they'll slice the neck, and and then the, the the blood will spurt out for a while, as it does when you cut the neck of a of an animal or any living creature, and they'll that blood will go onto the statue. So they're still doing these animal sacrifices, which you read about in the the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament uh, of the Bible in the Jewish communities way back when. They're still doing that in places in Nepal and India in certain places. So I got to witness that uh, experience. Now, of course, they eat the meat and they do, they give some to the poor, some to the temple and some, the, and, and the rest of it they eat. So it does, nothing goes to waste. Um, here's a, a snake charmer in India. You've, you've maybe seen pictures of this kind of thing. These are like street performers. They're doing this uh, for some change. And, uh, and you see this kind of fun stuff throughout India. It's a beautiful country. Um, now, here is a dentist who is out on the street. You know, a lot of poor people, I mean, millions of poor people throughout the world and certainly throughout India, and they don't, they can't afford a dentist. They can't even find a dentist a lot of times. So there's guys on the streets like this guy here in the, uh, in the turban who he's just, this is his, this is his little case. And he sets up a little, puts out a, an old, you know, cloth sheet and he's got his you know he's got his rusty pliers here and a, a, a syringe you know who knows how long he's using that a, a, what looks like a metal file here and some some chemicals ointments medicines you know um, and he just sets up but I'll tell you if you have problems with your teeth and you don't have a dentist you'll go to anybody and so there's people like this set up on the streets um, to, to help people out and this is a uh, dent we we don't appreciate our dentists or dental work uh, in this country as much as uh, we would if we saw more of how some of people in the rest of the world, what they have to do. Uh, here is a, a couple of, of folks. This is a community on the border of Pakistan and India on the west side of India. And this, this is a desert dwelling community. They're nomadic as well. And they uh, when the when the waters come in from the ocean, they cover up parts of the desert where they live, and then they have to move along with their things. But this is how they've been dressing like this, living like this for centuries. Um, 
And you can see on this woman, you can see all the jewelry that she's wearing. Now that's, that's a dowry. That's, that's her, that's basically their bank account because they're nomadic people. They carry everything with them. So this is her, this is their family's uh, jewels, if you will. And if her husband were to die or something like that, or not come back from, from some pilgrimage journey or, or something, she would sell the jewelry and that's how she would support herself and her family. You can also see tattoos on her forearm and these tattoos mark different rites of passage that she was gone through, you know, her tribe, her family and different rites of passage when they do the tattooing. You can also see the tattooing on her neck as well. It's not just adornment or decoration, but it, but it has some cultural purpose uh, for her. Now, this is a an elephant. He was basically being used as an advertisement. They put a sheet over him, which said, you know, buy this kind of toothpaste or whatever it was advertising. I don't remember. Um, but walking down the street, even in India, seeing a guy, seeing an elephant come down the street gets people's attention. And it's a great way to advertise your products. And so this was uh, just to give you a sense of some of the traffic we had to compete with on the, the streets of India. Now, in this case, this is a tribal, this is someone from a tribe called the Warli tribe around the middle of, of um, India. You, there, there are a number of different tribes. We went into this village and we're looking to see if we could find some tribal rituals or things like that. We biked in and someone told us about a doctor that had a clinic there who spoke English because he'd, he'd been educated to become a doctor and, and went back to the village. So we went to his clinic and there were all these people in line just sitting, you know, they had their lunch. They were just waiting in line to get into this house where, which was his clinic. Well, someone saw us coming. They, they went in and they got him. He came out and he at, we talked, we told him who we were. We said, we, we wondered if, is there a wedding or a funeral or something that we could go and, and take part in or witness? So he asked the people that were all sitting out there in line waiting to get in to his clinic. And someone said, oh, yeah, so-and-so is getting married over blah, blah, blah. And, he, and so he, he asked one of the kids who was waiting in line if he would show us that he had a little bicycle. So he said, sure. And the doctor paid him a rupee, like a dollar, and said, take them. And so he took us on these dirt roads, single track dirt paths that we could get you know, on our bicycles deep into this forest until we got to this village where this is the groom of a wedding that was in, that was uh, happening. And he the kid told them who we were and they welcomed us to be a part of it. Now you can see they, they rub, um, uh, I wanna say saffron, but that would be too expensive. It's uh, uh, a yellow spice from India that uh, if I were doing this live, you would tell me what it was, but I, I can't think of it right now. Um, but he, they rub it on as part of the, the ritual. Now, when we arrived, this woman who is like a, a medicine person or witch doctor or whatever, I don't know what would be the right phrase, but the, but the holy person of this village, she sat us down on a small stool and each one of us, and she sprinkled some rice around our feet and said some prayers and then put a dot on our, each of our foreheads. And then we were ready to participate and become a part of the wedding celebration. So we were purified and, uh, and made a part of the community. Now on the wall of the hut that the new couple was going to move into, they paint what they call a war. This is a Warley painting, they're Warley people. And you can see these paintings in museums around the world and in, even in the United States. It's, it's made with rice paste and they do it on these dung wall huts that they live in. And this is their marriage contract, if you will. This, is, this painting was put on the side of their new um, home and this is where they, they will live. And they, um, they, the night before the wedding, they sacrificed some chickens and some coconuts and some rice wine and things in front of this as part of the ritual and the preparation for the ceremony. So it was all fascinating um, to be a part of. Marlon? Yes. Somebody asked, how did you find clean, safe water? Ah, great question. So we brought with us a, a, a water pump, just a small one that you can travel with, that we could pump you know, a good amount of water so that we always had a fresh source of water. We could take it out of a river, as long as it wasn't polluted. I can't take chemicals out of anything, but as long as it wasn't polluted, it takes all viruses, bacteria. And so we were, we were always pumping 
the water and cleaning it the best we could. Uh, of course, boil, boiling it for 10 minutes also works. Um, and so we, we did our best, but we often would get some stomach problems because we'd go, people took us in everywhere, whether they lived in huts or wherever, they, they took us in and showed us great hospitality. And so often they'd be boiling their water for tea and then they just add a little extra water at the end, which then didn't get boiled for 10 minutes. And so we did find ourselves having to deal with some parasites uh, despite that, but we had to make sure we always had clean water. Now, speaking of water, <clears throat> this woman is on her way out to the, to the water source. She probably a pump where she's gonna wait in line for an hour or two and then her daughters, sisters, other women from her community will come. So she's going to put their, these water vessels in line to get her place in line. And then they're gonna carry that water back, which is very common. A lot of people don't have running water in their villages. And so they have to go to a water source. Now these are empty, but she, she couldn't carry all that if they were full. And you can see she's just walking along the, the train tracks, which is uh, just a flat place to walk but she'll go, you can see her beautiful outfit, the, the beautiful nose ring, and uh, just these little flip-flops walking on this uh, train, train tracks. She'll carry back one of those probably on her head um, with those flip-flops along the rocks. It's, it's amazing, the women are, are uh, pretty incredible. And the things that people do to, to get fresh water. Uh, there's this will give you a sense we never stayed with anybody like this but we'd stop and and we'd often have some cookies or some some food that we were that we'd have and they would boil us up some tea and we'd sit and talk india was fun because a lot of people speak english so we were able to have more in-depth conversations in many parts of india than we were in some other countries these are some hindu holy men that we found out in the the desert of of india where we were there on a feast festival day and you could see their bells and their different things and their costumes but there were lots of people from the village everybody, everything stopped and everybody was singing and chanting and dancing and having a great time then we went up into the himalayas of india and in the himalayas of india you could see the the snow cap himalayas up here these are kind of the foothills we went up because we'd heard that there was a a a bath, a hot spring, where supposedly the goddess Parvati, the wife of Shiva, the god Shiva in the Hindu pantheon, um, bathed. So it was a, a famous pilgrimage spot, but you have to climb for days in order to get there. Well, we arrived, there it is. Um, we, these other sadhus or Hindu holy men were there. These two next to me, on either side of me, they were on a pilgrimage themselves. This was the man who is sort of the keeper of the spring, and he lives there. And uh, we had a great time with him. He was a, a fabulous person, didn't speak English, but he taught us different, um, different plants that we could eat. So we were into, we had a book and we were trying to learn what plants we could eat because that was a good thing to know while we were on this trip. And, uh, and so we went off on a hike and we brought, collected as many plant, different plants as we could. And we, we held them up to him and he either told us to throw it away or he said, okay, keep it, keep it here. And then we cooked, we, he used it to help us. And we all cooked a meal together with some of the rice and other things that other people on pilgrimage brought to him uh, along the way. But we learned some plants. Now, here he was, uh, he had a blanket, a big pot to cook in. He had a little trident staff and a bell and a conch shell that he would blow at sunrise and sunset. And that's all his possessions. Everything else, he lived up on this mountain waiting for pilgrims to come and bring him fruit or vegetables or rice or some offering. And he just lived off their offerings. Here's Did another. you ever experience altitude sickness? Yeah, uh, mainly in Tibet uh, at the advanced base camp at 20,000 feet. We all got a kind of headaches at night and uh, and were a little uncomfortable. It was, uh, that was the highest we ever had gone. Now, most of the time we were climbing on bicycles to get to Tibet from, from the Gobi Desert all the way into, into Lhasa, which is at, I think, 10 or 11,000 feet. So by the time we got there, we were fine. It was all very gradual. But once we got to 20,000 feet, and that all happened, that, that last sort of 4,000 feet all happened in the course of a couple of days. We, that, was a, that was a little high for us. So we didn't have oxygen. So we came back after that. Um, this, this sadhu, this is down in the desert, down at, at lower altitudes. He's a sadhu who follows the god Shiva in the Hindu tradition. So he takes ash every day and, and, and sort of 
puts it on his body because Shiva is gray. So that's that's the thing. And Shiva has the kind of dreadlocked hair. So he kind of keeps his hair sort of matted. But in his hand, he has what they call a chillum, which is a kind of pipe. It's shaped like a cone. And uh, they put in there some herbs, but but also, most importantly, some hashish, some uh, f form of marijuana that they smoke as part of their devotion to Shiva. Now, what's interesting is these older guys, you know, this was a, a festival uh, and, and these older guys were go coming to to be with him and say the prayers. And they all passed around the chillum and, and these older men and everybody smoked and said prayers and devotion. They lifted it up over their head, said a prayer before they smoked. And it was this ritual. Uh, one of the things I think about is uh, about the religious freedom that they have in India. I mean, here's a man who, who owns nothing almost, you, you know, who has drugs as part of his, his, his religion and uh, is walking through the streets. Some of these holy men, they call Nagababas, are completely naked. And, uh, you know, we'd be arrested for a few different things uh, if, if we did any of some of those things in our country, whereas there, they're considered holy men. And the people touch their feet when they see them coming through the, through the markets or something because they believe a holy man can take your sins through their feet. So instead of being arrested, they're uh, lifted up. Uh, so it's, I thought it was interesting. This is in Calcutta where they still have rickshaws, one of the last places in the world where they still have rickshaws. And on a rainy day when the streets are flooded, it's one of the only ways and best ways to get around. Uh, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit faster because I see I only have about 10 or 12 minutes. So uh, this is in northern Pakistan where four, three of the biggest mountain ranges of the world, the Karakoram mountain range, the Hindu Kush mountain range, and the Himalayas all come together. They all collide and create one of the most amazing landscapes I've ever seen. So I'll just show you a few pictures of some of these mountains. You can see me down here on my bike. And uh, every time we turned around a corner, it was like a, it was like a stage curtain opening and this beautiful scene. Um, and you can see, again, way above the tree line when we were up there. But then we'd get into these valleys, into these passes where it'd be lush and we could pick fruits off the trees and camp out along on farmer's land or on, on land along the rivers. And it was just beautiful all up there to the, to the borders of Afghanistan. We did run into some avalanches and uh, sometimes the cars couldn't pass for days, but we were on bikes. We were able to kind of carry our bikes over the avalanche and keep going. Uh, this is uh, the Indus River. This was a, kind of on a day hike crossing that you can see is a, a little bit of a rickety bridge that is about 300 yards long to cross the river. About at, the, at its lowest point, it's about 100 yards over the river. So we, uh, we crossed that on a day hike. I thought you'd like to see that uh, picture. Um, this man up there in northern Pakistan is making wool, you know, using a spinning top in the, in the old fashioned way. I mean, that's the, but that's the way they do it. Uh, you can see the wool wrapped around his arm and then he just spins it with the top and turns it into yarn. Um, this man up there is using a millstone over a creek where he's taking rice and turning it into flour. And that millstone is being uh, turned by the small creek that's underneath his hut. These people live right, they're the Kailash people. They live right on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. In fact, Kailashistan, their, their tribal land, their historic property was cut in half when the British left, gave half to Pakistan, half to India. But these Kailash people, these are the women, these are the females. They continue to wear these very traditional handmade outfits. Um, they live way out, far away from everybody. And uh, you could see they all the, the females wear five braids, one of them, the one in the front tucked behind their ear. And uh, they just have these beautiful cultures and customs. When I was there, they were doing these dances all night long. They would play drums, starting with the youngest kids at, right after dinner. And, and by two o'clock in the morning, it was the oldest men in the village playing the drums and the women were all dancing, locking arms like you see in this picture, but all the way into a circle. And they would spin and spin and spin for hours. It was amazing to watch this happening. And there's all kinds of culture and things that happen around these uh, festivals. This was a harvest festival that they were doing for weeks up there. And I happened to, to stop. Now I stayed with this family. This is the grandmother. And every meal we ate these, these whole wheat pancakes, basically, that she made and some feta cheese and some salt. 
that was basically at one time there was some chicken, but otherwise it was just every meal. And it would, she would just put all these pancakes on a big basket with a bowl with the feta cheese and the salt. And we would just, first the men would all eat with our right hand and we would just eat around from the same basket. And then when we finished, it would be given to the, to the mother and the children. And when everybody was finished, then the grandmother got to eat. So that was how it is. And, um, you know, I just participated and try to rebel against their, their system. But I will say that I, I stayed home one day and watched grandma making dinner. And I noticed that she ate while she was uh, cooking. So she's not, she's not dumb. You know, she made sure she got fed. Um, now this is, I'm skipping quickly to Northern Vietnam. Um, so, uh, I had to. Wait, we, I had to actually take a flight to get from uh, from Thailand into Vietnam because I couldn't go through to countries in between Cambodia. It was closed, and some others. But bicycled three thousand miles across Vietnam from the south all the way into southern China. And when I got up into the northern part of Vietnam, I came across all these minority peoples or, or indigenous peoples who. I've never, you know, in all the Vietnam movies and other things I saw, I never saw all these amazing peoples who live in the mountains of Northern Vietnam. Uh, these are, this is a Zhao tribe, is a female of the Zhao tribe. These are the males. Often the, it's the females that carry on the traditions. Um, you'll see like on the, they're Buddhist people, these, these folks. And so they have uh, what we know as the swastika, which is an ancient Hindu and Buddhist symbol um, woven into their clothes. This is, this necklace, uh, is again part of that dowry. Um, these folks uh, farm chili peppers and they come into the market and sell them. Uh, this is a Hmong, a young girl from the Hmong tribe or Hmong people. We have a number of Hmong people who came after the Vietnam War and during the Vietnam War into uh, Oklahoma. Uh, here's some more. Of the, these are the boys in the Hmong tribe. They have this beautiful indigo cloth that they dye um, and and uh, and make. You could see the women in the market selling uh, the cloth, selling other kinds of things. Um, this is a typical village of, of the Hmong people up in northern Vietnam, up in the mountains. And then we crossed into China, and then there's all these minority peoples or indigenous peoples throughout, throughout this part of China as well. So this is a woman who, uh, I mean, this woman's like three and a half feet tall, uh, maybe a little bit taller, um, but you could see just carrying this huge, but look at that smile on her face, carrying just all this, uh, all this, um, straw on her back and in this this is a, a wonderful market that we went to outside of Kunming China and you can see these women have pigs on a leash um, they're selling their pigs uh, it was just so fun to watch these are these are actually women uh, called the Nashi people which are a matriarchal tribe so you don't see too many matriarchal cultures left in the world this is one of the few uh, that still exist now this woman in this market I love this picture she's got her fish trap that's a fish trap that they use in the rivers and things to catch fish. Um, and then the ch her chicken, her basket of chickens on her back. So, I mean, just, it's just the, it's, there's so much color in this market, it is delightful. Now, another dentist. While you're getting your chickens, your fish traps, your pigs, you can also have a tooth extracted if you want. Now this, you can see, these are all teeth down here at the bottom. Their heads, I looked at them, there's some huge holes in those teeth. I guess you wait as long as you can when this is what you have to turn to in order to have your teeth pulled. But here's a guy out in the market, no electricity, he had a drill that was foot pump, a foot pump drill. And basically this was his advertisement. I mean, he didn't have a license, but he could say, look, I've taken out thousands of teeth. I know what I'm doing. And so this was his certificate right here. And, uh, and um, you could see his pliers and uh, his little mold, his little tooth mold and his little toolbox. But again, dentistry, I, I, I have a high, uh, a high sense of, of what, that, what that is after this trip. Now, I just quickly went, um, uh, eventually found my way, having crossed China once, gotten to Afghanistan and Iran and gotten turned around, crossed back across China, found myself two years later in the Philippines and not sure where, where to go from there. Thought about going down to Australia, New Zealand, but then knew I was gonna be even further away from everything. So ended up finding an inexpensive flight that took me to Poland. So the two of us, we, we flew to Poland and, uh, and then crossed down to Israel through, through um, uh, you know, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Turkey, 
um, into Syria, Jordan, and Israel. So I'll just show you quickly in a few minutes. This just going, I, many people have seen pictures of Europe. A lot of people haven't seen Turkey and, and the Middle East. So this is the Blue Mosque in Turkey. So we went from this Christian culture um, throughout Europe into all of a sudden, you know, cross a border. And now all of a sudden it's Muslim mosques and turrets and the call to prayer. These are Sufi, whirling dervish uh, is often what they're called in English, but these are mystical Muslims who for centuries uh, have been doing this practice of whirling where they whirl into a trance state and they do this beautiful dancing. Uh, people have heard often of the poets Rumi and Hafiz and other 13th century mystical Muslim poets. This is the home of of Rumi where he lived. And the man on the left is the sheikh or the head and the others are devotees. Uh, crossing the desert, we came across a lot of nomadic peoples in the Middle East. This is in, um, this let's see, is in Syria, this woman. Again, you can see the tattoos which mark different rites of passage in her, in her life. Uh, it's not so much beautification as it is uh, uh, markings and cultural tattoos. Here's, I'm in the one in the white there. This was a family in Syria that took, took, took us in and, uh, and gave us some hospitality. Of course, they wanted to dress up and take a picture. They put me in their most formal outfit for the picture. Um, and then my bicycle got run over by a tractor in the desert of Syria. And so uh, I thought my trip was over at that point. Uh, it was pretty bad. As you can see, the cranks and the frame and everything was just uh, the wheels. And they did, just don't have these kinds of parts um, in Syria. So I thought I was stuck. But it turned out I found a shop and these guys were able to weld things back together. They had to send my, my frame to an aluminum welding uh, facility. They handmade machine parts, spokes and other things, threaded spokes and made things to, to fit. And they were able to get my bike back together. It got me all the way to Israel from Syria. Um, but uh, it did, my crank would fall off about every uh, 30 miles or something. So I would always have to put it back on, but you know, it got me to Israel and I left my bike eventually in Israel. Oh, and they, they fixed it all. And it was like $60. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, this is me crossing into Jordan. Uh, these are some nomads in, in Jordan when in the Bible, when they talk about the, the desert, 40, 40 years in the desert, this is the desert they were talking about. And that's made of goats skin. I mean, goats wool. Um, you have the women who sleep in one side, the men who sleep in uh, women and children on one side, men in the other. Uh, we stayed there in this particular family in the morning. We took some pictures. I still have my hat from Vietnam that the kids wearing and, uh, and uh, just wonderful hospitality. And then made it to Israel where this is uh, in Jerusalem. This is the what's considered the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, one of the holiest places in the world for Jews. Of course, this is the third holiest place for Muslims. This is where the temple was that you read about in the Bible. If you know the Bible, it was here and now there's the mosque there. And so this is a very big dispute between Jews and, and Christians in the, uh, in the Holy Land. So you could see even at the Wailing Wall close up, you see have, it's a, you, re, you really feel like you're in a militarized place and the soldiers keep their weapons with them at all times. Here's an Orthodox Jew praying at the wall. You can see he's wearing the tefillin, which is, it's got prayers in that box on his head. Which, and then they wrap all the way around their arms as part of their ritual in the Jewish tradition. They pray three times a day. Muslims pray five times a day. Uh, as far as Christians and Unitarians, we're lucky if we can get them to pray once a week. But we, you know, uh, every tradition has its own customs. But I do find it interesting that the forehead seems to be a, a spiritual place in the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, also in the Jewish tradition, and even Catholics who dip their finger in holy water. And the first thing they do is touch their forehead and then cross themselves. Marlon, we've got just about three minutes before we need to end. All right. Well, I think this may be my last picture. Uh, this is a bar mitzvah, which is like the confirmation or the coming of age ceremony for a Jewish young person. This is the, the Torah scroll here. So inside here, you have rolled in parchment, rolled in leather, uh, handwritten the words of the Hebrew scriptures or the old, what we often call the Old Testament. Um, and he is being brought uh, in this ceremony, turned into a man where he'll take on all the mitzvahs and commandments of his tradition. Uh, that's in Israel. And that's it. My last, you know, when I came back, flew back to the East Coast, and, uh, and then bicycled across the United States over nine weeks 
to um, Spokane, Washington. I began my trip, uh, flew to Japan from Seattle. So I kind of made a full circle after that. And uh, that's my that's my story, uh, at least the best I could do in 45 minutes. Um, thank you for joining us. And I'm that's sure amazing. We do have a few questions. Yes, please. Any questions? Okay. Uh, one person said that the just tower. About two minutes. And okay. then. How many? About two, two minutes. And then okay. another library webinar is starting on this account. So. All right. All right. Uh, somebody said that the powder was probably cumin. And somebody asked about during a huge trip like this, how many bicycle tires, extra chains and stuff, uh, how much gear did you take? And did you finish the trip with the same bicycles with which you started? Yeah, we, I finished all the way to Israel on the same bikes and then a new one when I got back to the United States. Uh, carried, always had to carry stuff to replace everything. So we had replacements for everything with us at all times. And, uh, and, and we used a lot of it. So it was uh, because we couldn't get stuff uh, where we were. So we always needed in the middle of the mountains, we couldn't afford to, to have a problem and not be able to fix it. I wouldn't think so. How many miles did you back on the entire trip and how many pounds of supplies did you carry? Yeah, so we, we biked about 25,000 miles total. And <laughs> we, uh, we carried, you know, we always had enough uh, water and food to get us through. Um, every, every, you know, depending, there were times like through Tibet, we, it was a couple of months where we only were going to stop at a few small villages, but we had to count on the people to help us with food. And that's uh, we, amazing. But people were wonderful to us. Somebody asked, they were amazed by your memory. Really incredible. Did you journal or take notes throughout this experience? Oh yeah, I journaled and we used to send, uh, we used to send newsletters home to our families. We would, you know, Xerox copy and send it home and then our parents would copy it and, and mail it off to a group of people, 40 friends or something like that. So we didn't have internet and all that back then. So we just did it old school. How right. your we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to end for the next okay. webinar starting. So right. well, hey, thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. so much. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for letting me relive the journey. Appreciate uh, it. It was amazing. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs>